So pricing of securities had to do with the valuation of what the securities was valued at. And it was one of these sensitive type of situations that a lot, some people backed away from saying, hey, that's someone else's problem. Someone needed to take ownership of it. And that ended up being me and having to see it through its ultimate resolution which involves some working with senior management, working with the clients and their side of the business. So that's one of the things that I'd like to impart on you and your audience is if you want to get far in life, you got to do things that nobody else wants to do. You got to do the hard things, the easy jobs, someone else will, can take those. But if you want to separate yourself from your peers, you have to be willing to step up and do the hard things challenges because it's easy to shy away from them and let somebody else do them. But those are missed opportunities for you to advance in your career. Welcome to the show. Thank you for listening. We've got a great show for you today. You want to be a CFO? We're going to tell you how. We've got Milton Miyashiro on the call today, he, you're going to learn multiple paths in accounting, and there's many of them. You're going to learn the key to achieve the highest roles like global head or chief, COO, CFO. He's going to talk about how to develop a specialty in accounting and how to figure out what your specialty should be and the importance of all knowing all the different roles in business if you want that CFO job. Welcome to the show, and welcome to the Edge of Excellence. Well, Milton Miyashiro, thank you so much for making time for your busy day as a CFO, and welcome to the Edge of Excellence. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Great to be here. Well, we're going to start off the way we always start off. Milton, why don't you tell us what your definition of excellence is? My definition of excellence is kind of rooted in the old adage, you know, how you practice is how you play. To me, excellence comes about by, you know, understanding where you can make mistakes, where there's limited consequences, as in practicing. And then so that when it's game time, you know, you've done everything that you can to succeed. You've ironed out all the mistakes. You've rehearsed. You've made sure that when it's game time which represents really 10, 20% of our lives when you're really on stage, you really have to impress that you've done everything that you can to form, to form at your best and be excellent. And to me, nothing in life is perfect. In fact, one of my current, current sayings that I love is perfectly imperfect. And that's what I used to describe myself and my family. I love the imperfection of life and dealing with it. So that to me is how you strive for excellence is dealing with imperfections. Okay, so how you practice is how you play and practice through and mastery through many hours of practice. Do you tie it to the 10,000 hour rule? Um, does it matter? Is it excellence in certain areas or does, does excellence have to be achieved in all areas for someone to be excellent? I think there's different philosophies about putting where you put your time in and whether you want to become the expert, the greatest of all time the goats, right? It's, there's that, but I think excellence as far as my path to becoming a CFO has been understanding what you can and cannot do. That's the most important thing is compartmentalizing the things that are obtainable and the things that you just have to leave behind. And that is creating the focus and the clarity to get where you want to go in life and to achieve excellence doesn't mean you have to be excellent in everything. It means you have to understand the differences between being the expert or knowing when to go to experts or when you need to be relied on or when you need to rely on other people. And it's having those skills of being able to discern who can be impactful in your life and who you can make an impact on, I think they're very important. So if you're listening right now, I mean, you're trying to think about, you know, I got to get to 10,000 hours, got all these different things to master. Um, it takes a while. But if you understand what you can and can't do and then focus your many hours of practice, you will become excellent in the areas that you were meant to achieve in. And we're going to get into the areas that Milton was meant to achieve in, which is the finance world. And he's been all around it, ending up as CFO. And we're going to talk about what it means to be in finance, what the different jobs is he's had. 
what a CFO is, what a CFO does. Before we get there, let's look at Milton's life. Milton grew up in Huntington Beach. And where'd you go to high school in Huntington, Milton? Huntington Beach High School. Huntington Beach High School. Shout out to Carrie Kone and Jessica diltz Dietu, who I know listened to this, that also went to Huntington Beach High School and worked at National Services Group many years ago, but we're still friends. God, I love Huntington Beach High School. And were you uh, an excellent student? Were you an overachiever? Were you crushing it in high school? Yeah, I was, you know, typical Japanese kid growing up in Orange County, you know, had high expectations from parents set upon their kids, type A type students. Uh, I was a student body president, forced me out of my shell. I played basketball. I was very active within the high school. I have to admit, I was probably very immature and an arrogant ass in high school, you know, and that classic question, what would you say to your 18 year old self back, you know, if you had to look back now and give them advice is to get over yourself, buddy, <laughs> you, you got a long ways to go. And if you think you're smart now, wait till you get to college, wait till you get beyond college, wait till you get to real life. Life has a way of humiliating you. And I think success in high school doesn't necessarily breed success in future life. It's all about what you do in the moment. And and that's one of the things that if I had to caution anyone is, you know, it's easy to get good grades. You work hard, but it's all structured and it's all planned. And there's procedures that teachers have to follow, the school districts have to follow. But it's what you do outside of school that really matters. And that's what I think helps sets up young people for their careers in life. You mean after or during? Both. A little bit of both. You know, the school provides a very, in my opinion, a very safe environment to succeed. You know, it gives you the path. It shows you what you need to do to get good grades. But it doesn't necessarily show you what to do beyond the schoolwork and the academics. And the soft skills in life. You know, those are the skills that I think develop professionals. And most people in school, in high school, you talk about, what do you want to be when you grow up? That's great to have goals and dreams, and I want to do this and work towards it. But percentage-wise, the number of people that actually end up staying in the profession that they thought they would is surprisingly few. Most end up deviating and basically adjusting. And that's part of life is adjusting to where the opportunities are and having the courage to take those opportunities. Yeah. yeah so uh, Milton's not saying don't get good grades. He's saying <laughs> that that good grades are not as important as the stuff that you're doing outside. And um, you, you don't get to be CFO. You don't get to be CEO. You don't get these big jobs if there's not a path. The basketball, we've heard it on this show many times, the basketball, the student body president, the club you started, the job you had, um, you know, that's where the interpersonal skills, that's where the leadership skills, that's the foundation for that. Um, the academics helps you figure out a profession. And Milton just mentioned, you're probably going to change, study, say your career six times. So if you're really good in science and you're studying to be a doctor, you can use that academic education, but if you decide not to be a doctor, it's all the other stuff that will help you succeed in whatever you do. And I've seen people go from doctor to lawyer to business person to someone starting a charity, you know, crazy changes. Um, so you're you're looking back and it's the basketball, it's the student body president. Those things are giving you the the skill set more than the math classes that you, you also needed, but you don't become CFO without basketball, but you can become an accountant with just the, uh, the accounting classes, right? I agree. Yeah. I, and yeah, you're right. It's not, getting good grades is important. Studying is important, but I listened to one of your previous podcasts and just being present and showing up is even more important. Don't waste your time. Don't waste other people's time. If you're going to go to class, be there, be present and bring your game is what it is. You know, if you're sitting there playing games while the professor is talking to the teacher is doing something, you know, you're just wasting everyone's time, including your own. So if you're going to commit to something, go all in is what I like to live by. Yeah, so mastery through met through many hours of practice. You know, student body president is a few hours of uh, leadership. You know, captain of a team is a few hours of leadership. Jobs is a few hours of customer service interaction, you know, sales building skills. And you build on that and build on that and build on that. And so Milton goes from Huntington Beach High School, which is Huntington Beach, cool place, by the beach, uh, you know, kind of a hip environment. 
and time for college. And you go all the way to the cold white north to Notre Dame. And Notre Dame, you majored in uh, what did you major in? Accounting. Accounting. Major in accounting. And yeah. so coming out of high school, you kind of knew you wanted to go into accounting. No, no, I didn't know what accountants did. Okay. So was, how'd you uh, figure it out? I was a entering my junior year and they say you had to pick a major you can't just be floating around with general ed classes pick a major and i was in my dorm and there's a bunch of accountants that had like looked like they had a lot of have fun i mean they were great students smarter than hell and i said oh maybe i'll pick accounting i had no idea what a cpa was hmm. turns out to be a tough tough major accountants yeah. are like not for everybody yeah yeah <laughs> but i gutted it out and uh, it was a great decision because it set the foundation for my business career and my financial career. Okay, I do want to ask you about one thing. You said uh, you would go back in time and tell yourself to not be an arrogant ass. And that's interesting. <laughs> so what if you weren't? What if you were a timid, kind of scared, uh, lacking confidence? And I wonder, is arrogance just unearned confidence? And it's like, I think I can, I think I can fake it till you make it. Would you really not want to be arrogant? I would define myself as being arrogant in that I wasn't respectful. Oh, okay. Oh, that's difference. a different. There's a big that's difference. That's a different yeah. thing. Oh, okay. I didn't respect the authority and the experience of others. I was all wrapped up into myself. It was all about me. Oh, okay. okay. And okay. I would that's always blame story. everybody else for why I wasn't doing things well or why I wasn't succeeding. And it wasn't until after college, because I was still fighting it in college. I was an arrogant ass in college. And it wasn't until after college that I realized, hey, it's not about you. It's about everyone around you that makes yeah. you who you are. Okay. So it was kind of an enlightenment that I had. You you had youth. If you're listening right now and you're not quite out of college or maybe you're just out of college, this might resonate with you. You can think you're cool. You can be the, the head guy on campus. You're the fraternity president, the best fraternity with the cutest whatever. Um, nobody gives a shit out of college first of all nobody cares everything that was cool in high school and college becomes uncool out of college and one of them is disrespect there's this misunderstanding yeah. in high school and college you know you're a womanizer and you're cool you're picking on the nerds and you're cool you're the tough jock whatever it is there's a misunderstanding and it completely flip-flops pretty quickly like rapidly and I remember when it flip-flopped on me and I realized, oh my God, that doesn't work. So you were, I don't mind the arrogance. I don't mind believing in yourself. But if you're disrespectful and you're not taking personal ownership, you're actually just immature. You're just immature. And if you're listening right now and you're tired of those people, they're done in a couple of years. They're done. By the time you're 25, it's cool to be respectful. It's cool to take care of others. It's cool to understand differences. It's cool to you know, treat women well. Okay, I'm glad you clarified that because I don't I don't mind a little overconfidence. I think it you got to fake it till you make it. I do know that it got in my way. I've seen it get into other people's ways. You clarified pretty well. So you're at Notre Dame. You get kind of hoodwinked into picking a major. And by the way, Milton is the DI for those of you that listened to one of the first episodes, the DISC episode, which is a really important episode to listen to. Really helps you pick out the right career. He's in the wrong career. He's supposed to be a <laughs> he's supposed to be a high C. If uh, if he's an accountant, but to be a CFO, you kind of need that D and that I. You need to influence people. You need to drive people. You can't just be a numbers cruncher. So you're sitting at Notre Dame. You get this great degree in this great major. And then straight out of uh, a college, you go to Bear Stearns. No, actually. So talk about humiliation. You know, all my peers at Notre Dame are getting these great jobs right out of school. Right. They're all recruited on campus and. I graduate with barely a B average in accounting. And I'm saying, God damn it, you know, what's wrong with you? Did you just waste four years of your life? But my senior year, I studied my ass off outside of school to sit for the CPA exam. And in May of that year, I passed two of the four of the hardest parts of that exam. I didn't find out until August. So I basically came back to California with a tail between my legs saying, Parents, thank you for helping with my education, but I'm going to get a, go to a penny saver and find a job and landed a first job at a local CPA firm. And I then learned that I passed two parts of the CPA exam. And I said, you know what? Shit, I could do this. I could do this if I put in the work. And it didn't, grades didn't matter at that point. It's about what you could do going forward. 
And that CPA firm was local firm in Orange County. Oh, that's here, right. Gave me an opportunity to say, hey, I can make a, a, a go at this. And I did. Did it for three years. And then I went into mortgage-backed securities and a taxation of that. And I got my master's in taxation part-time at Golden Gate University at night. Again, putting in the extra time uh, part-time at night. And then it launched my career into the finance world. And that's how I ended up at Bear Stearns in New York. And and remind me about that accounting firm. You you liked it. Um, you uh, were kind of figuring out what you know corporate accounting is, getting into taxes a little bit. But was that a job that just kind of had a low a low ceiling? There wasn't a lot of advancement, and that's why you started to branch out to mortgage backed securities. Yeah, exactly. A lot of smaller CPA firms, you know, like a lot of CPA firms, it's a pyramid structure. You only have so many partners, you have so many managers, and you have a bed of seniors and associates and all that. And like most places, if you don't see yourself on that partner track, you have to make a decision. Do I want to stay in public accounting or do I want to venture out into something else? And I decided after being a senior in three and a half years there that I wanted to do something different. And I got recruited to do taxation and mortgage-backed securities. And that was an interesting time in the early 90s. You know, that's when Orange County went belly up. And they went bankrupt because they had bad investments in these mortgage-backed securities. And that kind of launched my career from a tax side, specializing in a very unique part of the uh, Internal Revenue Code. And that's what kind of launched my career onto Wall Street. So there's there's the first kind of uh, why in the road if you're going down an accounting path. And, you know, a lot of times people, you know, they, they do what, what, what Milton did. They're in college. They got to pick a major. They don't know what their major is. So they do what their friends tell them or, you know, they go with what they think's right. You're better off doing what I call wormholing and um, taking a disc test to figure out what your personality is, reading my white paper to kind of get all the, the jobs that are in your spectrum and then reading some job descriptions um, to see what kind of, uh, what gives you butterflies in your stomach and what makes you kind of sick to your stomach. And if you spend some time reading some job descriptions, you don't have to just take a chance, but in accounting, you know, there's, I don't know how many, there's probably a thousand different careers in accounting. A lot of people will try public accounting, which is basically doing taxes first. And the path there is you move up the ladder to partner. Many people will do that for a couple of years and then slide into other um, other fields. They can go into corporate accounting and move up the path there to maybe a CFO, or they can go into the finance world. And Milton's done both. So he did the public accounting. That's step one a lot of times. And, and if you have a big public accounting, uh, uh, one of the big four on your resume, it does give you more pay later in life. If you don't, that's okay too. So you go into public accounting first and you're doing taxes and Dealing with clients so you get to polish up. Well, tell me tell me what public accounting is like so people know. You tell me, not me. Yeah, public accounting, it's a service business. You're servicing your clients, your corporate clients, your individual clients. It is all about being their experts when it comes to audit, tax, compliance, regulatory items. On the other side of the business is when you get into corporate accounting and small business accounting. You're actually doing it for the businesses themselves and working with the outside CPA firms. So there's, as you said, there's so many different paths through the accounting and the finance world, because it's kind of inherent in any business, you need these experts to be able to process things both internal and external. So uh, it's, it's almost like as an accountant, though, you do have to define yourself eventually. Do I want to be an auditor? Do I want to be a tax guy? Do I want to be a regulatory person? That takes a commitment. You can't be a jack of all trades when you get into the accounting and finance world because eventually you're going to have to be able to be specialized in something to hold on to. Yeah, so you may try some things out, and it's very common for people to start out with public accounting and move to other to get that foundational understanding. Because public accounting, you're, you've are you got clients that, as Milton says, um, rely on you as an expert. Corporate accounting. You are the person that is doing the doing the actual taxes, making the decisions, analyzing things, and you're calling your public accountant for more expert advice, or maybe you know a lot about, I don't know, doing doing business, 
in different countries and foreign exchange and how to handle foreign exchange, but you don't know a lot about captives. And so you call your public accountant for expert advice on specific in specific areas, and then the public accountants will uh, either review or audit and help you complete your taxes. Um, so most, a lot of people will go into either corporate accounting, rise up the ladder, public accounting, um, and finance is kind of a different world. So you branched into finance through mortgage-backed securities. So you're probably in your public accounting firm, and this is how it happens in consulting and accounting. You start to see different things because you're working with different clients. Sometimes those clients hire you right out of the public firm because they love you so much, but you want to specialize. This is a way to kind of see all the different things. Consulting gives you big exposure. Public accounting gives you exposure. So you're doing public accounting. You get exposed, I'm assuming, to mortgage-backed securities, and you're like, oh, I kind of dig this. Is that how it happened? That's right. That's exactly right. Uh, yep. Yeah. yeah, so the mortgage-backed securities actually moved me from the traditional accounting and tax work into fixed-income investments. And I was working with bonds and past their entities as far as issuing these securities. And you learn a different world. And that's one of the things where I think I evolved in all of the aspects of fixed income finance. When you think about the legal part of it, the data management, the accounting, the finance, you're talking about a whole different um, analytics. Levels. analytics, especially with securities and investments. Uh, regulations with the SEC and everything that's required. And so my my advice is as you're starting your careers is also understand your specialty, whether it's accounting or finance for the people that are similar to me, but it's also understanding those that are around you that feed the whole ecosystem, the legal side of things, the regulatory, the compliance, and the business side of it. You know, working with salesmen and who are driving the business and working with the production folks who are executing on the business, having that broader understanding actually makes you more valuable as a subject matter expert in your defined fields of accounting or finance. Or anything else. Or anything, or else. anything else. You want to be a CEO? You better know a little bit about accounting. You better know a little bit about law. You better know a little bit about operations. You don't have to be the expert but you have to know enough to be able to converse, lead, and learn more. Mm -hmm. So Milton doesn't... Yeah, and appreciate. Appreciate what and, those people do. You know? And appreciate. So Milton doesn't have to be a lawyer and understand law, but he has to be able to know where I might want to ask a question, where I might want to call in an expert. You have to know what you don't know. So you need exposure in all these areas to know what you don't know. Another great reason to go into consulting or go into public accounting um, as you discover your career because you get all this different exposure. So you, you get into mortgage-backed securities that tickles your fancy and you decide, I want to move to New York. Is that how it worked? Or yeah, all the best jobs yeah. were there. And you went straight to, was it Bear Stearns first? Well, actually, I was at Price Waterhouse in D.C. for a year and uprooted the kids. And my wife and I just had our second child. And we said, hey, let's try something different. Young in our careers, you know. And uh, we did that for a year. Then went up to Bear Stearns and was there until Bear Stearns fell apart and J.P. Morgan had to bail him out. So that was another life event, <laughs> financial event that impacted our lives, you know. Wow, that's so, so, and I know I mentioned this, oh, by the way, didn't mention this. Milton is the CFO of the company that I'm partners in, and uh, he's the new CFO, so I'm recalling our interview, and I think I told you this, I know I told you this, but my wife's cousin and her uncle both worked at Bear Stearns at that exact same time as you. <laughs> so, so, so it fell apart, J.P. Morgan Chase had to buy it out, which is, I think, J.P. Morgan is, I believe, four times larger than Goldman Sachs. I think it's they're the biggest in the industry. And then how did Bank of America and Merrill Lynch come to play? Came to play through a former manager of mine at Bear Stearns. You know, once Bear Stearns kind of kind of blew up and everyone left and JP Morgan kept who they wanted to, he ended up at Bank of America and he said, Hey Milton, I'm getting the band back together again. How would you like to come work over here with me? And that and the B of A was going through their merger with uh Merrill Lynch. And that was interesting times. And that was a good lesson in your network. And what's interesting, when you look about developing your network, a lot of your jobs don't necessarily come from your best friends or your family. It's really an associate that worked with somebody else, someone that knew you, 
kind of someone who had an idea of what you did, but may not necessarily work directly with you. And if you keep up that network and put yourself out there, it'll be, you'll be amazed at what type of opportunities just kind of land in front of you. And that's what happens a lot in the finance world. You've got someone that you work with and, you know, you go off and find another position and you want the best person to work with in that new company. So you call up the people, not your buddy. You don't call up your best friend, not your brother or your sister. You don't call up just people that, you know, you call up the person that's going to do the best job because it doesn't matter what you know or who, you know, it matters what you do with what you know and who, you know, so the value of your network. And I've seen people bringing the same people from company to company to company. And in fact, Jill's cousin and her uncle, they uh, David Solomon was working with Jill's Jill's cousin, and he moved with Jill's cousin from company to company to company until they ended up, you know, really, really crushing the world at Goldman Sachs. So that's um, so that's an interesting, interesting scenario. And then what happened? You're in you're in. Uh, mortgage-backed securities, you're loving life, you're in these giant businesses, and then something happens and you decide to move to Thompson Reuters. Yeah, again, someone I used to work with at Bear Stearns ended up at Thompson Reuters saying, hey, you know, we need a compliance guy to kind of clean up uh, some of our work here. How would you like to come over here for this opportunity? And I did that. And it was great. It was uh, it was a single contributor working as kind of the head of their regulatory compliance for the fixed income pricing world. Did that for three years, got their first SOC 1 report, which is a compliance report uh, done with Ernst & Young. So I initiated that. And that was a great experience to learn that business, that part of the business through audit. Because when audit, you get to see things, you get to develop the programs to review other people's work, and it's a learning experience. And that's one of the things as an auditor, you realize is there's things that you can bring to help processes improvements by pointing things out. And then on the other side, being audited, everyone hates it, but sometimes it's not a bad thing. You get to kind of discover and look sense of transparency of what really is going on and where there are opportunities for improvement. Well, I know I always loved the reviews and the audits that I that I've had on different boards because of the audit report, which is so eye opening. And I can just imagine being the person that goes from company to company to company, actually auditing and seeing how everybody does things right and wrong. I mean, imagine how how great you would be as an accountant if you were an auditor first watching what everybody did right and wrong and all the right ideas you would be able to take from business to business to business. So let's talk just for a second about what all these different roles are and maybe dig a little bit more into auditor. What's an auditor? Um, then we'll get into what's you know working in mortgage-backed securities. And then we'll get into what's regulatory compliance. And then we'll get into what a CFO is. Uh, but why don't you tell us, you know, you come out of uh, college, you go into public accounting and you weren't an auditor there though, were you? You know, yeah, everyone has to be to get their CPA. You have to be some okay. form of audit. A CPA is such a broad designation that includes tax, includes audit. You got to be able to look at inventory and financial statements. So all CPAs at one point were auditors in their careers. Okay. And what exactly is an auditor? I don't know. We've talked about it a little bit, but what are we missing? Yeah, an auditor is basically someone who reviews the financial statements of somebody else and signs off that what is being presented is fair and reasonable. And you know, an unqualified audit opinion means that it's a clear reflection of what the reality is today. If you have a qualified audit opinion, there's some issues, there's some problems that have to be disclosed. So the you know the ultimate goal from an auditing standpoint, especially financial statements is to provide clean financials. Now, there's different kind of auditors. You have auditors all over this world as, as it relates to inventory, counting bits and pieces. It's all you know? verifying the numbers. So if someone builds the numbers, exactly. you're looking at their assumptions, you're looking exactly. at their process, and That's you're looking right. at their numbers. That's right. You, there's you, internal uh, audit. There's external audit. You know, there's always someone looking over your shoulder. And then there's the IRS. And they audit all of us, you know. <laughs> Fortunately, it's only 1% or 2% of the time for individuals, but they're out there. So if you're doing something on your tax returns that don't look right, it'll get flagged and you'll probably be put under audit. 
All right. And so then you go into mortgage backed securities. What were you doing there? What exactly does that mean? Yeah, I was doing uh, taxation of mortgage backed securities. So I was looking at the tax elements. There's this thing called original issue discount and premiums when you're in a fixed income world where you buy bonds below or above par. And it's the amortization of those that determine your yields effectively on your investments. So I was doing the tax reporting on those. Uh, I was also working on. And so this this is uh, this is giant organizations buying huge bundles of mortgages. Exactly. And they have different. I'm assuming the mortgages have not just different terms and rates, but probably different tax bases. Some of them. Uh, and you're going through and making sure the organization is accounting for it properly and paying the right taxes on the money they're making and losing investing in mortgages. That's right. Yeah, it's it's really the security side of the mortgages too. So the whole world of securitization, it's mortgages. And what is that? What is securitization? Mean? Securitization is where you take a, a blanket of mortgages, a whole pool of them, and basically securitize them. It's what Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and Ginny Mae do from a government-assisted funding standpoint. There's also a private sector, you know, it's... And what does Securitify them mean? Securitify means you're taking all of these mortgages and loans and receivables and basically packing them into a security, like a pool of trust. So Securitize means you put it in a, into a form where people can invest. So exactly. yeah, yeah, you'll get someone that does a single mortgage, but when you invest in mortgages, you're investing in a bundle of like a thousand mortgages. That's right. That's right. That's and the, the bundles example. are based on credit ratings of the people borrowing, the size of the mortgages, the type of the mortgages, the length of the mortgages. So there's all these different things that are being put together into a mortgage backed security. That's right. And based on which type of product it is, there's maybe different tax ramifications that someone needs to specialize in because there's so many variables. There's people that specialize just in that one area of business. That's right. If you one of the great movies for post financial crisis was The Big Short, you know that kind of described all the characters and actors that were involved in what really blew up the financial world and led to Bear Stearns and Lehman's demise. You know, which it was, was mortgage backed securities. <laughs> was mortgage backed securities all asset backed securities? It was everything. It was collateralized loan obligations, collateralized bond obligations, mortgage backed securities, asset backed securities. It was really the the lack of regulation that led to rampant lending, over lending, over leverage that then got passed down to other investors. And when everyone started defaulting and not paying, it just trickled down to everybody. So if you've heard of the Great Recession, uh, you probably yeah. should have. <laughs> uh, you might have been young then, uh, but the whole world collapsed. That's right. And why did the world collapse? Because people were leveraged too far on their mortgages and they'd been given payments that they could maybe afford at the time. But if anything ever went wrong, they couldn't. And the design of mortgage mortgages and mortgage backed securities created a, tr a, a ripple effect that took down absolutely everything. So you're in the midst of all that where you, you were there right, right before, during, before, like at Bear Stearns. During Bear Stearns, which nobody knows of anymore, used to be one of the yeah. big banks. And then after cleaning up at J.P. Morgan's Chase in the area that was the the first domino to fall. Yeah. Yeah. And you think about those times, there was tarp lending, there was government bailouts. You know, all the industries got bailouts from the government to help them stay afloat. So we went, just went through a COVID thing, right? And we had to help small businesses and everyone stay in business. You know, 2008 and nine, you know, the government was challenged to how do you, you know, not create a, another depression here, you know, and they Bernanke and all of those folks, you know, the, the key actors did whatever they could to keep our financial system in place. All right. So you're in mortgage-backed securities. The world goes to hell in a handbag. But you're learning, you're figuring things out. And oh, wait a second. What's happened so far? So far, you've already changed careers once. <laughs> now you're going to change yeah. careers again. So yeah. you change careers the first time because you're getting exposure and you you realize you don't want to be a public accountant. And you're going to go into one of those areas you were exposed to. Pretty common. If you're listening right now, this might be your path. Then you're doing that. And the whole world changes. 
And interesting that you move into regulatory compliance after that. <laughs> right, right. A little bit, a little <laughs> bit tired of watching people burning from the lack of regulation. And so what did you do in regulatory compliance? And what is Thomson Reuters? Yeah, Thomson Reuters is a market data vendor. You know, at the time, you know, they're, they're a pretty broad company. They also do uh, law publications and so forth. And they're a news agency. You, you've heard Reuters News, but they had a division, financial and risk. And part of that division also included supporting Wall Street with market data, basically taking exchange related data and transferring it from the exchanges to investors, money managers, asset managers, mutual funds, so forth. So there I was looking at, and again, I had to figure this out. I had not done this before. So I had to do a lot of extra work, a lot of extra studying in terms of how you create this unqualified report, which is a clean bill of health on their valuation service. And that's kind of been the kind of mantra of my career is, I have to figure things out when I start my next job. And I'm doing it here at NSG right now in this new role. It's making the investment of time and understanding all the intricacies in order to deliver a product. And that's what I did at Thomson Reuters. Well, have to is an interesting phrase. You don't have to. You don't have to do the extra work. You don't have to do the extra study. You don't have to. If you want to listen to the edge of loserdom, <laughs> but if you want to be on the edge of excellence and you want to be global head of regulatory compliance for Thomson Reuters or global head of pricing services for Thomson Reuters or global head of rights management and master data for Thomson Reuters, those are the jobs that Milton had. He didn't start off out of college as global head of. He started out of out of college, not even at a big four accounting firm that some of those Notre Dame buddies of his got to start out at. He went home, picked up, uh, dust, uh, picked himself up, dusted himself off, went back to the books, figured out, oh, maybe I'm not as bad as I thought I was when those mean ass college friends of mine were telling me what a loser I was. Because remember, high school, college, all that changes. They start supporting you, not being mean when you get out of college. And started a long life of, oh, the same thing everyone that's excellent does. Studying, um, learning, going out of your way, going the extra mile, because working hard is common in every single industry where people are excellent. You want you, Taylor Swift? She's a great singer. No, she's great at hard work, marketing. She happens to be a good singer. There's a thousand Taylor Swifts in the world that don't work hard, so they don't get to be Taylor Swift. There's a thousand Miltons in the world that, or probably millions of those, that don't work hard, but they don't get to be the global head of, they don't get to be the chief of, because it always takes going the extra mile, figuring out what you want to learn. But what's, what's really fascinating about you, Milton, is you're figuring out these little areas where you want to learn. You're kind of trying things out and becoming an expert in these different areas. So what is, and, and and we know the path to, well, we don't know it, but we got some some enlightenment in the path to global head of and leader. It's getting in there, working, doing homework, signing up for classes, reading books, listening to podcasts. Um, I, I go to conferences all the time, you know, whatever it is, but it's a focused learning on being better. What does it mean to be uh, in regulatory compliance and then again, what does it mean to be in pricing services? It, it it means, as far as this learning journey goes, it's surrounding yourself and making connections with people that could teach you things through conversation. You know, you have to surround yourself with smart people. What people what is what is exactly regulatory oh. regulatory compliance? Regulatory compliance is really about um, understanding how the rules of the road work from a either the governments or through industry. There's certain best practices that have that need to be followed. And you're and making sure those. that that Thompson Reuters, That's which is right. building data decks and giving the information to Wall Street that's going to control investments, which is all regulated that's right. and sometimes comes with criminal penalties, you're making sure that they're doing things right. 
That's right. Because when you, in, back in the two thousands, early two thousands, you had actors like Enron and WorldCom all blowing up because no one could trust their financials. And you look at crypto and Bitcoin right now, right? It's going through its actors that are because of no regulation. Because of no regulation, and that's all of the Sarbanes Oxley came out and created a whole new industry of regulatory compliance. And you see it now even in in data platforms, you know, you see it in cybersecurity. There's a whole industry right now of people going into cybersecurity audit to make sure to find the phishing scams and everything that's going through the internet. That's that's like an auditor, but you have to have a technical background and understand the IT part of the world. And that's where the worlds collide between audit and information technology. And you see things morph and evolve as the businesses change. Wow. Uh, and so you're in uh, regulatory compliance, which is not the same as pricing services. So how did you jump? And we see how you jump from one to another, which a lot of people do when it comes to public accounting to a specialty. But how did you jump from helping people understand what the regulations are, being an expert in the regulations? And they're complicated. There's many, many, many pages and jumping in. It's the you can't do that because person. And we see it in every, you got to have someone like this in business, especially if you're a DI and I hear it all that we, we just had a meeting for college works and the VPs are sitting around. They say, we want to do this. And I'm like, no, nah, I can't really do that. Why can't we do that? Because there's regulations against it. There's regulations against so many things. So you're in this world of making sure people don't make mistakes, don't do things that are illegal. And honestly, there's so many things you can do that are illegal and wrong. Like, for example, just pay somebody for working all day. Did you know that they needed breaks? Did you know mm -hmm. what their minimum wage is? Did you know that there has to be taxation? Did you know that they have to be paid within certain amount of hours? There's all these regulations just in that one thing. So you're in that arena saving people. And then you move into pricing services, which I guess also saves people, making sure we're not undercharging or overcharging. What exactly is pricing services? Yeah, the pricing service was fixed income valuations, where on a daily basis, we provided asset managers with the value of their securities. And I got moved into that role because from a compliance side, we had some very sensitive issues that were raised. These are red flag type issues that you don't want uh, to get public. You don't want to go to court over them. And my manager at the time said, we need someone with a thick skin and who can handle this type of customer relationship. And he said, I think you should be leading this group. Now that you understand wait, the group. Wait, <laughs> wait, wait, customer relationship, meaning you're telling the clients what they can charge for their security we're, we're telling the clients that at the time in this one particular instance we had misvalued their securities oh and we Whoa. had to go and show that we had the proper controls in place to make sure that this wasn't going to happen again Wow. So pricing of securities had to do with the valuation of what the securities was valued at. And it was one of these sensitive type of situations that a lot, some people backed away from saying, hey, that's someone else's problem. Someone needed to take ownership of it. And that ended up being me and having to see it through its ultimate resolution, which involves working with senior management, working with the clients and their side of the business. So that's one of the things that I'd like to impart on you and your audience is if you want to get far in life, you got to do things that nobody else wants to do. You got to do the hard things, the easy jobs. Someone else will, can take those. But if you want to separate yourself from your peers, you have to be willing to step up and do the hard challenges because it's easy to shy away from them and let somebody else do them. But those are missed opportunities for you to advance in your career. And so your your hard thing was basically go tell people you've mischarged your clients, you've exactly. put yourselves at risk, there exactly. might be some mega penalties, there might be some jail time. It was kind of our fault, but yes. stay as a client. Yes. yes. Wow. 
So that's where yes. your influencing skills come in. Yes. And that's where your driver yes. skills come in. Wow. And being able to work through that type of bad movie. You know, you got to have a certain steady state to you. Can't take it personally. Can't get emotional. It's all about getting to the resolution that would make everyone, quote, satisfied. Wow. And then after that wonderful experience, which, I mean, that must have shown you so much about how to interact with people, how to calm people down, um, how to show your values, how to listen. That must have been a wonderful uh, experience to help build you up for your future job as CFO. And then you go into global uh, head of rights management and master data. Real quick, what is rights management and master data? Rights management is where you have to be contractually compliant with the information that people are providing you. You can't sell it and make money off of it. You basically have to agree to the terms of the contract. Very much in our business, when we work with our vendors, we, you know, there's contracts with our vendors and we have to respect those. And I got that job because Bears, uh, Thompson Reuters at the time sold out to Blackstone Private Equity and they decided to lay off three people and said, Milton, we want you to do their jobs, all three jobs. And that's how I ended up doing those three jobs for the last three years of my career in New York before I moved back to New York, uh, California. And you're figuring out if any of your clients are, are subscribing to your data and reselling yep. it to yep. others. Yep. All right. yep. So, so another, you got to be ready to get in the thick of things and fight it out driver type job. Exactly. Exactly. And then you came to us <laughs> and uh, now you're CFO. So this is the path to CFO. There's many paths. There's many different routes. There's all these thousand careers in accounting, but they all kind of start off with, well, a lot of them start off with public accounting or, but they all go through some form of moving up and moving laterally and moving up and moving laterally through different areas and becoming experts in different areas. But like Milton said before, knowing the specialties, but knowing other things as well and being able to converse and you move into the role of CFO. And so what is a CFO? What does it mean to be chief finance? What's what what exactly does a CFO do uh, for those people that are listening and they're they're in their 20s and they don't really know? A chief financial officer, you know, really has the broad purview of everything finance driven. And that includes the accounting tax, cash flow management, uh, working with where you invest your money, working with the CEOs, working with the, the business in terms of managing the finance of a company. Cash in, cash out, however you want to define your profits, it all comes down to the use of cash and the sources of those cash. And that's what a CFO is really designed to do is be able to translate to the CEOs who are great at building a business, who are driving the business, and put the numbers, the, the compliance with the taxes, the strategies in terms of what's the best entity to work on. The role of a CFO is to be a consultant to the CEOs, but also help manage the business within the operations itself. So you know most areas of business. You know most areas of accounting. Um, you've been able to see professionals in the law area and the accounting area and the finance area over your career do their job, make their mistakes, uh, have their achievements. So you've got this basic knowledge. You're expert in some areas. and um, and if you look at Milton's expertise, it's not in real estate. It's not in um, construction. It's not in um, multi-brand, multi-entity, multi-state business. Those are the three things that we do at National Services Group. Very complicated business. We didn't need him to be experts in that. We needed someone that knows most areas, is expert in some areas, but is able to oversee all all of finance and accounting. So a CFO usually isn't straight out of college. You don't become a CFO unless it's a very small business. Usually a CFO uh, title happens after a few years of no, of learning areas of business and becoming an expert in some of those areas. Uh, but it's the oversight of all finance and all accounting that requires the people skills, the leadership skills, the communication skills. And so what do you think, you know, as you're looking at the CFO role, what's the most exciting element 
of being a CFO for you. And it's going to be different for different people. Some people are going to want really focus on one, but what's the most exciting piece for you that, that interaction between all the C-suite? What is it? I think the most exciting thing as a CFO in this seat is really looking at operationally how this company performs from an efficiency standpoint and understanding where process improvements can come into play. You know, when you're launching new companies and new initiatives, you know, it's kind of a race to get to become operational. But at the same time, there's opportunities after things kind of start in their own rhythms to improve processes and to create efficiencies that actually drive the bottom line. You know, if you have two people doing the same thing, you know, why? You know, if you have three people reviewing two other people's work, why? You know, it's asking those questions of, you know, not disrespecting what got you here, but how is how can you do things just a little differently to make things better and always improving the process? Technology is always improving, and I think processes always have to improve at the same time. That's why I see an opportunity here, and that's what I'm excited about, uh, especially because there's different businesses that you have to be respect each business and their uniqueness. But within each business, there's, I think, a lot of opportunities to you know improve processes. So you're back to that consulting role, or it's not an auditor. An auditor, an auditor is crunching a lot of numbers and analyzing a lot of things, but they become a part of being an auditor is being a consultant. That's so you've right. got the analysts, you've got the leadership, and you've got that consultant. You're consulting with people, and you're and actually, if you think about it, most leadership, high leadership roles in business are kind of consulting roles. Um, the other people are are really running with it, managing it, owning it, um, hitting the home runs. You're helping them. You're kind of a coach and a consultant. And that's the path to becoming a CFO. Well, Milton, I really appreciate I want to respect your time. I know we've got two minutes before you've got to head to another meeting. I really appreciate you making time to come on the edge of excellence and share with everybody this career path. Thank you for making time today. Great. Thank you, Matt. Enjoyed being here.